a monsoon. Are we recording? Oh, yeah, buddy. Oh. I just heard like a bzz, bzz. What up, friend? What up, beautiful people? I, like you're at the intro there when you say. Hello, beautiful people. <laughs> curious, curious. Welcome curious. to Curious Show's podcast. Blah, blah, blah. A show, <laughs> I don't remember exactly what I said, but. Where we explore the infinite, infinite complexity of, of the human, human experience. experience. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like we have a cult. They're going to hear it twice <laughs> now. Uh, yeah. Um, We'll we'll keep this one short, I guess. But yeah, uh, yeah your friend uh, Josh came on. And Josh Yenton. Yenton, yeah. well, what a cool dude! Yeah, we had a fun time. He's yeah. he's traveled uh, a lot of places uh, in uh, Asia, and he ended up in Ecuador. He has a really fun uh, YouTube channel and uh, TikTok. It's called uh, Local Living. Local and Living, yeah. He's just a really cool dude. Like we 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 talked about a lot of stuff, so I'm I'm sure you guys are gonna enjoy it. So. Yeah, like this guy just literally just said one day, "Fuck it, I'm leaving," and he just left. Montreal yeah. and just very inspiring. Yeah, gave it, me the gave me the juice to to try it myself. And I to think. be honest, this is like the first time I spoke to him in like four years, five years. Yeah, but it showed you guys were like old friends. It was it was fun to 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 watch you guys play off and and kind of catch up in a way. I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah, and he brought up some memories that I even forgot. The fa- <laughs> that you guys will the listen. Flames to that are you're gonna, you're gonna hear the flames. <laughs> Not my best moments, you know. So I think it was one of your best moments. Like when you're in heaven at the pearly gates, that's gonna be one of the highlights. You're gonna make Peter laugh, bro. He's gonna go. <laughs> the fuck is this? <laughs> you were 12, it's fine. Anyway, uh, yeah, give it a watch. I'm sure you guys will enjoy it. And please like, subscribe, share. It helps us out a lot. You guys know the drill. Yeah. Hit, hit the bell on YouTube or whatever. Click all the things. Yeah, just because we, we want to start connecting with you all more. And we're going to start putting out more cool videos. And we have new ideas in, in the works. Uh, we're going to start different types of videos. I think that's in the pipeline. And we're trying to get on bigger guests. And it's up to you guys and us. We all kind of work together. We can start getting some really interesting... Look, everyone we have is super interesting, but maybe we can get some like uh, more some a big fish. Yes. <laughs> Lately, some a big but fish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing the money thing too. I don't know why <laughs> a big fish. Anyway, but yeah, so just we love you all, and like thank you for letting us or watching us and allowing us to kind of go on this weird journey. Tongue your cochleas, <laughs> fill your ear orgasms, <laughs> stretch our epiglottises. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everyone, stay curious. Yes. What's up, beautiful people? I'm Nathaniel Pearl. And I'm Sam Sheva. And welcome to Curious Chimps Podcast, a show where we explore the infinite complexities of the human experience. We do not endorse anything illegal. So please, consult the doctors, do your research, and for the love of all that is holy, be safe. All right, let's talk about drugs. Curious, curious, curious chimps. Yeah, give the little clap. <laughs> and okay. scene. Josh, I haven't seen you in like, um, fuck, I don't even know how long. I know you're... Long fucking time, man. Yeah. I, f- I, I just see from your feed that you're like traveling the world or something, trolling around in South America or in, in, in Spain. I don't know where you are, man. You got to tell me all about this. <laughs> well, it's been... The, so the last time I lived in Canada was six years ago. It'll actually be six years next month. So I left May 2015. So the last time I saw you, man, was probably probably right before that. Probably I was choking out jiu-jitsu, right? It was like a 7 a.m. jiu-jitsu class, I think. <laughs> well, I used to teach the wrestling at H2O. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, Jeez, yeah. It's been that long. Holy shit. So, yeah, man, six years. Been uh, lots of travel since then and haven't really settled back in Canada and not planning to, really. What inspired this? You just... You, like, you know, it's it? one of those tales... Um, you know, I finished university, went to McGill. I was never a big school guy. I did it because, you know, it was the thing to do. And parents and friends are like, you got to go to school. You got to get a good job. That's and then pretty the quickly, I was like, fuck this. <laughs> um, like, fuck the system. I know it's a little cliche. But lots of people say that. And lots of my friends were like, um, you know, I'm school not for me, but I'm just going to tough it out for 40 years, get that juicy pension, <clears throat> and then sail off into the sunset. Mm. So I was 20, I was 21, sorry, no, 22. And I was doing my graduate degree. And after my first semester, I was like, fuck this. So I got three of my buddies who wanted to travel. And I was like, I'm buying a one-way ticket to Bangkok. No plan. Barely had any money. I'm like, you guys want to come? And they're like, you know, we got summer jobs lined up and we got this and that. So I basically cut ties with all my with all the ties I had in Canada. Like I quit my job, 
said bye to my family, my brothers, whatever else I had going on. Um, bought a one-way ticket to Bangkok, convinced three of my buddies to come with me for a month. And that was basically how it started. Fuck. A little hangover-esque. <laughs> that's, that's incredible, man. That's like, you know, the funny thing is like people talk about this like as a dream, but they never, like most, I would say 90%, 95% of people don't actually do this. That's true. I'll pick up and leave. Yeah. Like I think about that once a week. I'm just like, <laughs> I just want to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> so, so why don't you do it then, Sammy? I'm scared, man. How did you do <laughs> it? Give me what? Some scared of what though? Running out of money, uh, coming back home with my tail between my legs, uh, you know, just not having some kind of j- p- position or job or education and just having to like wait tables at like 36. Like uh, just all the crap man right so but those are the typical things right it's always money and job it's mostly revolves around money mm, sure. because we're, we're so ingrained into always you have to have a solid job you have to have money to do this and that yeah and i had seen stories like you know this is before the internet was as as um i don't know what the word is like widespread per se mm. like stuff didn't go viral as much in 2015 but i remember seeing some stories of people just picking up and leaving and being like i'm making five grand now in thailand you know, banging Thai bitches and doing cocaine every night. <laughs> and I don't want that. I don't want that. Yeah. But I wanted that lifestyle, mm. just like the travel lifestyle. Yeah. Like that so I, I did make a mental list, um, you know, like the money and the jobs and the family. Sure. And I just said, fuck it. Like, you just got to commit and, and take the first step. So what was the process? I mean, going there for the month, like, so I, I, I can relate to just the Thailand portion because I went there for a month and I went with the ambi- with the idea of no return ticket. I just went one one way and it turned out to be a month i was actually content with coming back like i felt the need to come back yeah. but what was that like hitting that one month mark because i know for me there was like the one month and it was kind of like my time range but going from there like, i'm sure it wasn't easy at first well, the one month arc was challenging because that's when all my friends were leaving mm-hmm. to go back home yeah. so it was my first i traveled in europe once by myself when i was 19 so that was like three or four years prior to that in 2011 or 12 so one month came and all my friends are like, Josh, man, it's been fun. We're heading out. <laughs> and I remember that first day was, I was depressed and lonely. I was yeah. like, I don't know what to do now. Yeah. I didn't have my crutch, like my friends to, to wake up to and talk to every day. Yeah. Was there like a big plan at, or, or something there? Or like, did you have like a, cause you knew you were oh, going to stay, I, right? Yeah. I had no plan. Mm. I had no plan. <laughs> I had saved up like six grand, I think. Yeah. And with that six grand, I wanted to travel for six months. Okay. And have you been to Asia, Sammy? Uh, I went to India once and s- about about six grand, well, a bit less actually, but it lasted me a good six, seven, uh, six months. Like, uh, yeah. So, but, and, and I lived, I lived it up. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. I, I spent some money. So that, it's, like I've been to India too, and it's very similar to Thailand, you know, like cheap beers. Mm. But the thing is, it's cheap if you're not spending that much. But one month of having my buddies there was party every night and, you know, you're doing cool experiences and, and cool shit. Yeah. So, man, my, my money ended up running out after three months. And I was getting down to, like, <laughs> triple digits, like oh, yeah. $120. <laughs> so what, what did you do to get to, to sustain yourself? So it was three months of traveling, and I, I started off in Thailand, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Okay. That's kind of the, the typical Southeast Asia route. Yeah, most people are doing that when they go. And then I Googled how to make money like abroad, mm. some, some dumbass Google search. <laughs> and what came up was a bunch of ads from South Korea. So it said like, make 4,000 a month, make 3,000 a month. And then I just clicked, I was naive. I clicked on the first link and it was some company based, recruiting company based out of Toronto. And I just put in all my information, um, your name, your nationality, whatnot. And somehow I ended up in Korea in August. So this trip started in May and by August, I arrived in Korea, end of August. Okay. What was this job? It was just. It was an English teacher. It was an English yeah, teacher yeah. job. Okay. That's kind of the thing in Korea. Mm. So, went to Southeast Asia, blew all my money in three months, <laughs> and then kind of kind of was forced to take this job or go back home. And I, I knew I didn't want to go home, so mm. I ended up accepting this job in South Korea. That's the thing, I guess. I mean, I I I went to India with a plan of staying for a month, and then I was like. I, a part of my brain, a part of my heart is going to still be in India. Like I just canceled my return flight and I stayed there. But after a good five months, I was like, okay, I'm running out of money. 
like maybe I could try to like teach yoga somewhere and just like get stuck on a beach somewhere. I feel like I would get trapped and just like have some kind of little like a like a kind of game loop, you know, and just be like I can I can eat, I can survive, I could go to the beach every day. It's like, but do I really want to do that? And I kind of spent the last month preparing myself to chicken out and kind of saying my goodbyes mentally. So you did the opposite. You were like, I've had three months. I've had like a pro- hopefully like an awesome time. I blasted through my savings, and now I'm just gonna like find work and continue my life away from home, make a new home somewhere. Like, it's like the decision was made from the day you left uh, the first time. I guess like you were not planning on coming back. I'm exactly, guessing. I had that mindset from day one. Mm. But you, you know, the thoughts like you have still crossed my mind. Like those thoughts back then, I was like, fuck. Like, what if it doesn't work out? What if I don't have a job? What if I can't finish school? What if I have no more money? Like, I don't want to be working in a fucking, I don't want to be a janitor when I'm in my 40s. So all that negative self-talk definitely entered my head. That's fair, man. Do you still, do you still feel today that you can kind of just like canopy and just like like eject whenever you want and just kind of come home and maybe you have like some support system and and you can, is that even still a thing like today? I do now. I do feel a little more comfortable and obviously financially I'm better off and, and I haven't burned the bridges. Like, I still have all my friends from back home. I try to go back once a year. Obviously, during these times, it's a little hard. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, it's definitely a bit of a, a crutch for me, knowing that I can go back to Canada. Like, my family and friends still take me in. Yeah. Maybe it's a safety net. Maybe it's, like, allowing you to have this exploration, you know? It's it's not a necessarily a bad thing. I know sometimes, like, you know, that there's that scene in Batman where, like, you if you have the safety net, you're not going to jump as far. So, I, I, can, respect, I can respect that. But I, I, I'm... So... Oh, wait, please go, go ahead. Oh, you go ahead. I was just going to say, like, I, I don't want to shift the conversation too too harshly, but I, I don't want to skip over those three months. Like, I like I just I want to know what happens. <laughs> no, man, let, let's skip over those three okay, months. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's your what, call, buddy. <laughs> what happens in Thailand stays in Thailand. <laughs> Nate, Nate gets me. Nate gets me. <laughs> it, it, it was nice. Those countries yeah. were nice. Now let's talk about it. Yeah. I just got to ask you one thing, because in Thailand, did you end up getting a chance to check out Pai? I did, a few times. Is it a phenomenal? It's It's a unique place. At least in my experience. Well, especially for your hippie ass name. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's what it comes down to. Yeah. I, that was right at home there. Like, Ooh, let me write this down. Yeah. But it's funny because <laughs> I, when I was in Pai, I was actually researching how do I make money in Thailand. And I was looking at teach, teacher, to, teacher jobs. And I was actually planning my potential stay there. And then I realized I have so many projects back at home that I want to actually pursue. So it's kind of like it was something that when you travel like that and you kind of disassociate from your home, from your nest... You start getting all these cool ideas and start, you know, you can actually manifest a lot of it. But I, I just, uh, I still had the need to come back. But I just remember thinking that for a while. I'm like, how do I make a life here? This is incredible. And, you know, a big part of traveling too is that honeymoon phase. Mm. Like you both know what I'm talking about. The first two weeks or three weeks, you're just in, you're in heaven. Mm. Like everything is so cool that you just want to talk to everyone. You want to eat all the food. <laughs> but then, you know, at a certain point after that, I don't know if it's three weeks or a month or two months in, but reality starts to set in. And it just becomes, it's like anything in life, anything becomes a chore after, you know, mm. it's not as fun getting drunk. It's not as fun, um, like exploring every day. You get tired, it drains on your body. Yeah. I guess it's a kind of person too. Like my, my brother pointed out to me lately that I should like, it, like it, people in general should just lean into their strengths. And he's like, you can, you can just kind of adapt, you know, like it can be a bad thing sometimes if you're in a, in like a loop and you're stuck at home kind of thing. But it's like, yeah, just go to some country and figure it out. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, I guess I could do that. I've done it before. It's like, so I guess maybe Nate has that quality as well. You obviously have that quality as well. And it can be that double-edged sword where you're anywhere you go, you end up being kind of just like bored. And it's like, well, it's a living. Like, I'm just doing my thing. Even though you're in like mm. fucking Ecuador or something, you're like, well, let's just do this now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And don't, don't, I definitely have the personality where I have fun. Like, I, I'm always, I'm just a happy person. Like, I'm a happy-go-lucky. I'm always down for something, mm. something adventurous. But it's not meant for everyone to travel. Like the whole the whole idea of of travel and visit other countries. Some people are just like to to work their nine to five and come home and kiss their wife, and th- that's about it. Yeah, and I mean they they find fulfillment through that. So it's 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 good to not judge people's journeys. But it's always interesting when you see someone like you that just fucking steps out of the that that clear line <laughs> that most people follow, and then you're just fucking putting YouTube videos out, trolling on the streets of I don't know where you are, and uh, it's just it's it's refreshing to see that I that am. exists. <laughs> 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 you want to talk about that a little bit? Like, uh, is that something you're trying to create revenue from, like your YouTube channel and that kind of video blog 
of different parts of the world and just interacting with people. Because I know, I saw some videos, I don't know where you were, maybe it was Brazil, but you were like playing soccer, street soccer with people on the street and like dribbling the ball and stuff. Like it was really cool to see, but I'd love to learn more about it. Yeah, so this, this idea came to me last year, like right before the pandemic hit. Okay. And so I'm living in Ecuador. It's a city up in the mountains. We're 3,000, almost, sorry, we're 2,500 meters up in the Andes. Okay. Beautiful, like surrounded by... Um, by mountains everywhere and lots of history like the Inca. this used to be the Inca kingdom mm. So there's lots of history of the Spanish coming here and and fucking up the Incas and whatnot. So anyways um, There's another expat couple older people and they started this YouTube channel and it was one of those um, One of those channels like going around with the vlog camera like hey look I'm at the mountains. I'm at the park mm. I'm at this restaurant and They had like 60,000 subscribers Okay, jeez. In, in like a couple of years. Yeah so I looked at their videos and I'm like, I'm younger. I speak Spanish. I speak fluent Spanish. And I'm, it seems like I'm more part of the community. Like I have lots of Ecuadorian friends. And my friends were always like, you should do some videos. Mm. Like, cause you do funny, you do funny shit, like within like showcasing our culture. Mm. So, so yeah, that's how the idea, the idea for local living, like my channel, local living started last year. Nice. And then I put on my first video last June. So it's newish. Oh, yeah. That was fast. I saw a few of them. I loved them. I, there was a few I was like, I don't know, maybe this isn't my kind of humor or something. But then it, I saw like the pattern emerge a little bit. <laughs> I saw the, I saw the, the, the like the gringo president, like green, like, <laughs> like, like, like you for president. I saw the, the two guys fighting, like the kung fu thing. Like there were, there was a lot <laughs> of good so ones, man. Yeah. You saw the TikTok videos. <laughs> Oh, I, I just went on YouTube and saw some a couple of, or I think maybe it was the Facebook. Uh, I sent him a couple on uh, yeah, Messenger yeah. too. Okay, because the ones you're talking about are the TikTok videos. Okay, okay. yeah, because um, I, I don't have TikTok. My, yeah, my main focus is YouTube. Okay. Uh, okay, cool. I gotta go check them out then. Yeah. Yeah, check it out, man. Let <laughs> me know what you think, and you guys are always welcome to come down. Hey. Oh man, we're gonna take you up on that. That would be freaking great. But uh, <laughs> I like what you said because it shows in a lot of your videos. Like you're you're just talking to people that are there, and and it's. I mean, I, I don't want to sound like ignorant, but it does it does sound weird. Like you seem out of place, obviously, because everyone else is like a local and you're, you're like this like pale white dude. But like you're <laughs> everyone knows you and you're all just, you're just talking to them and you're speaking perfect sp Spanish. Like you maybe have a bit of an accent, but like you're you're perfectly fluent. And it's it's <laughs> right. like it's just fun to watch. Like you said, you know, you had that couple just saying like, hey, we're over here. Hey, we're over there. And you're you have that plus this just this personality that comes through and it's really like i'd love to see what else you have i can't wait honestly i'm kind of, I oh, kind man, of regret you're that making I me happy like what you're describing going into this is what i planned mm, like yeah. first of all having a white guy in a place like this it's not very touristy so <laughs> that alone stands me out <laughs> and then speaking with my shitty spanish accent like coming from french you know from french montreal yeah that makes it even funnier. And then just me like integrating myself in what they do. So they've been, they've been loving it so far. I like that. Yeah. They seem to be having fun with it too. Yeah. I, I want to go back to that moment when your friends left you in Bangkok or in Thailand. And then you said you kind of hit like that pitfall. So what happened? And then, oh, sorry, then you went to Korea and you started becoming a teacher and then, so now you're in Ecuador. So that's like the other side of the globe. So what happened from that timeline after Korea? Yeah, that was a bit of a jump. So yeah, I went from my friends leaving and then I decided to keep traveling like Vietnam, Cambodia. Then it was Korea in itself is a whole crazy, crazy world. Like oh, it's yeah. a very unique culture and pretty, pretty cool country. Hmm. Um, and the long story short is one of my good buddies in Korea, a guy named Corey Baker, shout out to Corey. His parents retired in Ecuador. Okay. So after doing a year and a half in Korea and like two and a half years in Asia, I was kind of over Asia. Hmm. Like you guys haven't traveled there. It's not easy. Like you can't speak the language yeah. and like learning it is difficult as hell too. So there are lots of like little factors that were just, I was ready. I knew it was time to go. Like I knew it was time for the next chapter in my life. Mm -hmm. So I went back to Canada for a few months just to regroup a little. And I was with my girlfriend and I was like, fuck, what are we going to do now? Like none of us want to live in Canada. Mm. None of us want to go back to Asia. <laughs> Europe's hard because with the visa system, you could only get, three months and maybe six months in some countries. Okay. So it's not like a permanent choice. Yeah. Um, so we thought of our friend, Corey Baker, whose parents retired in Ecuador. So I'm like, let's just fucking, let's just buy tickets. Let's do what we do. Have no plan. Mm -hmm. And let's just buy a one-way ticket to Ecuador. Yeah. So this was in 20, this was in October, 2017 that I left Canada after coming back from Asia and decided to go to South America, to Ecuador. Damn. 
Did you already speak Spanish? I spoke no Spanish. Oh, nothing. Okay. Like <laughs> cerveza. <laughs> <laughs> Por favor. <laughs> Por favor, man. That was the extent. Yeah. So, so you learned it in Ecuador. That's awesome. Yeah, I learned it when I came here. Wow. I guess there's no better way to learn. Did, uh, did you ha- did you did you do some online stuff? Did you have some people around you that spoke English and and like helped you, or did you just like dive in and you had to figure it out? Probably. I did. Have, I had a private tutor for a little, but it just it came to me easy. Maybe it was the French because the the language is very similar to French. Like okay. it's the whole the whole verb system is the same. Okay, sure. So yeah. it came to me easy. Like I'd say from going to zero to conversational it took me six months hmm, nice. of of not even necessarily like putting. 100% effort in just like doing my day-to-day stuff. Yeah, it's the it's uh there's this thing in psychology called the the mirror principle. It's just the fact that you're constantly exposed to something, your brain just starts like sucking it up. And I'm sure yeah. the French helped a lot as well, but I think about it also like because I have Duolingo on my phone and I never freaking use it, you know, but <laughs> like I I know that there's I know that there's probably like it's the 80/20 rule, right? Like in those first 6 months like you're saying, like you're going to learn like a hundred or two hundred words that you're going to use mm-hmm. most of the time for the rest of your Spanish career, let's say, and and then you start getting that extra ten twenty percent where you're learning some extra words. Now that you're fluent, there's these you can start really expressing yourself. And oh, you know, I love asking people who learn uh, another language later in life. Um, like, do you find you have another personality in Spanish? Is that a thing? Maybe. <laughs> No, I, I know what you mean, and I, I've been asked that before as okay. well. Hmm. Um, it's honestly, I'd say mostly my foreigner friends when I speak Spanish, like then I, I do a change. Like I'm Josh to Gringo Josh. <laughs> but the, the Ecuadorians, the thing is, none of them really speak English. So when I'm speaking English, they don't understand a word I'm saying. So I have no personality to them. They just hmm. like see my mouth moving. <laughs> but when I speak Spanish, they're putting, you know, they're putting like thoughts and ideas to my face. And... You know, when I was in Asia and Korea, that was the big problem. Like having lived in Korea for a year and a half, making friendships was really hard yeah. because everything is so superficial. Everything is like, oh, Josh, uh, uh, handsome, I like you, uh, eat, drink. <laughs> so it's hard to delve deeper in, in, into like making a deeper connection with, with, with friends. And, mm. That's yeah. going to weigh on you after a while for sure. Yeah, when I was in Thailand, I, I ended up having a girlfriend down there going for the full Thai experience and we were going on dates and all that <laughs> and I was just cracking jokes to her and she just like dead faced me just no clue what I said and I'm just like oh fuck it's not as simple as uh, it's not you can't get into super in-depth interactions if the language barrier is there you know mm. so a lot of those jokes just flew by and I just remembered I'm like oh shit I'm in Thailand it's not it's not as uh, easy as a conversation like this was this like a legitimate girlfriend? Or yeah, you know? legit. She was my, like, I went to like a massage therapist, like a massage clinic, like a legit one, not those rubbing tugs that are everywhere. <laughs> and then she was just, yeah, okay, mas- okay there, Nate. <laughs> yeah, you have to, you have to make yeah, a distinction. But, <laughs> well, because everyone pictures Thailand, they, they see the highlights of people's trips. But no, it was a legit, I had back pain, so I went to go get some treatment and uh, we hit it off. And then we went on a few dates. She took me, that was the cool part though, because I, I, start, I stopped feeling like a tourist because she started taking me like, to like Thai places where there's no tourists and I was just the only white boy and they were all trying to pitch me business ideas and all that kind of stuff <laughs> but for that one week that we were together it was actually it was quite nice to not feel like a tourist and just live the Thai life you know like I met her family and all that kind of stuff um, yeah but then there was that dread of like oh she doesn't understand me she <laughs> doesn't really it just starts kicking yeah, so <laughs> w- what happened here? well I mean I, I left right <laughs> I had to come back to Canada. Later type thing? No, I mean a heartfelt goodbye. I mean it was just like it was a kind of a we still talk in text but it's not like we're going to be dating long term or anything. Oh, I have I've never heard of this girl. No. Maybe maybe I forgot. Yeah. Maybe I just put it aside. It kind of lost its steam when she was trying to pitch me like a restaurant idea with her and her her business partner. Business partner. They just needed funding. So then I'm like, okay, I, I maybe this was yeah. like a one week of prep <laughs> <laughs> to try to try to bring some cash into their business. Uh, that happens though, man. It happens, you know, like uh, yeah. get, getting drugged by Thai people. Oh yeah. I I wasn't drugged, but I had a, one of my buddies was drugged. It was roofied and was super fucked up. But I've heard stories of of you know having a girlfriend. Now, I, I know yours was legit, <laughs> but then going to sleep and getting injected with some type of of I don't know what. Ooh, that's terrible. But then taking all your money, or or your ID or something. Ooh. I get any place that's touristy, you're gonna start getting that that those those sharks coming in and and just picking up the 
Yeah, I mean, the fish. I guess we could continue with the analogy. Well, there. The main thing I realized when I was down there is just you have to be alert. Like you can't put your guard down in a sense. Like you can have your fun and everything, but you always just got to be mindful, just because it's a it's a foreign environment and people are gonna look at you like any other tourist. So you kind of you can't. It's literally a foreign land. Yeah, like you don't know what the fuck is up. Like even in Canada, if you're not paying attention, you get hit by a fucking car. Or a goose or something that. yeah like when i was in thailand i actually i met a couple girls from quebec too so we were just parting it up and i let my guard we down everywhere. at some point and just everyone would like this was in pi of course and we were wasted at that point and the the this group of hippies just brought out these brownies and just well, started passing out brownies and i took one and i asked the bartender i'm like yo what's in these brownies and he's like don't do it don't do it like it wasn't weed it was something else rooms, bro yeah, it was an it was an incredible night. It was one of the most memorable nights that I remember two things of, but because you took them, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like that was the only time where I completely just let my guard down and just experienced Thailand like without any worry about my anything on me, you know. But it was maybe not the smartest move. <laughs> you guys have heard of the full moon party in Thailand? I didn't bother going. No. Honestly, it felt yeah. too touristy. The whole idea of it. Yeah, what's that about? It is touristy. It's what have you heard of it, Sammy? No, no, first time. So the full moon party happens once a month, I guess when there's a full moon. And it's 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 thirty thousand young people basically getting wasted, doing all the drugs they can yeah. and partying on the beach. So just a night of debauchery. Have yeah. you been you went you went to that? So I went there in my first month in Thailand. That was mm. like my first Thailand party experience. Yeah. First big party experience. And it was fucking up, fucked up. Crazy place. <laughs> well, you know, there's videos. And I, tell me if you saw this, but it's so stupid in my opinion. There's, I, You probably did it actually now that I'm thinking about it. But there's like this, like they light this rope on fire and then everyone just does skipping rope, oh, jump yeah, ropes okay, on cool. a fucking flaming rope. And the amount of videos you see, you can watch it on YouTube. Anyone who's interested, there's so many, f- literally everyone yeah. who gets hit by the fire, then they have like a third degree burn all over their legs. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's pretty intense because alcohol and jump rope are one thing. But when you have it on fire, it's a whole other story. Did you did you end up trying that? It, I, I didn't do it. it happened <laughs> to, actually, no, I did do it. I did a few jumps. But my buddy <laughs> psycho, got th- uh, second degree burns oh. from that fire rope. Son of a bitch. Jeez. Good old fire yeah. rope. I didn't, is yeah. there is there like I don't know I mean, maybe this is like a question I don't know if you guys know but like uh, is there like some like deep ancient cultural something with this full moon thing and it's just become like a tourist party or is it just like I, I don't know it's we'll um, a good question I have no clue both of our phones are busy yeah. so we'll just have to <laughs> Google yeah, the audience yeah. Yeah, tell us in the comments it wouldn't be surprised it wouldn't be surprising if there's some deeper roots to the party but you know how it is with tourists they just end up going and getting wasted. Yeah, so now it's definitely yeah. just a party, a party event. That's why I, I avoided it. To be honest, I was solo. I didn't really go there for the partying life. Like I did party a couple times, but it was really to explore and just become immersed. You know, thirty k people is you know, yeah. intimidating. Also, but you were mentioning like like your buddy got drugged and stuff like that. Did you experience? Well, I'm sure you have, but in your duration of travel, did you experience something scary or something that like you really Some made you foolery? Yeah. Oh man, too too many times. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you guys. I'll tell you guys one story though. It's probably when I was the most scared. Mm. Was in this country. Well, it was in Cambodia in a place called Kampot, which is a small town of maybe five thousand people. Have you guys heard of it before? No, I can't say that I have. I'm not familiar. So one of the like one of the hospitals in Asia is called Mad Monkey, and it's a chain. You know, it's like a back a budget backpacker hospital. Lots of people stay there. They got cheap beers. It's lots of young people. Like so you go there to meet people and obviously have some fun. Mm. So, so I was in, uh, this is coming back to me now. <laughs> so anyways, I had just got into Kampot, Cambodia, maybe my second or third night. And the hostel is having a party, a small hostel. Hmm. Um, so anyways, all of us go to the bar and we're playing some type of game where, uh, I forget what game it was, but it's one of those games where you have to do dares. Hmm. So I got dared to, to like, I was in my bathing suit. So put one of those floats, you know, like one of those animal floats in a pool. Mm. So that was around my waist. And I got there to, to like run around the pool while singing something, like okay. singing some stupid song. <laughs> so like seems pretty, seems pretty innocent and innocuous and whatnot. And then I go back to the bar with my buddies and I get a tap on my shoulder. And it's a, it's a Cambodian guy. And he's like, my friend at the table, broken English. He's like, my friend at the table wants to go talk to you. So I'm like, cool. 
you probably like my dad's thing, wants to buy me beer. Like, let's go see what's up. Mm-hmm. So I go, I go sit with him, and he ends up being the police chief of Kampa. Oh, okay. And, man, Cambodia is a very corrupt country, like other Southeast Asian countries. Yeah. It's like a shitload of corruption. So this guy is, like, starts off a friendly conversation. He's with a few other friends, all of them, all of them um, um, Cambodian. So he's talking, he's asking me nice questions, like, where are you from? Uh, what are you doing here? How long? And then it eventually he gets a little different, and he, uh, he takes out a gun out of his pocket, Ooh. puts it on the table, but the muzzle of the gun is pointing at me. And this came out of nowhere. Like, just as we're talking, just casually pulls it out, yeah. and the muzzle is pointing at me. So I look down, and I'm like, like everything cool? What's yeah. happening? Yeah, yeah. And the police chief's English is non-existent, so everything is getting translated by like the guy who initially tapped me on the shoulder. So he's saying, um, police chief wants me to go to his house tonight and party with him. So I'm oh, like, what geez. the fuck? Like, me and him partying at the house? And anyways, I find out that he's gay. Mm. Like, he's a homosexual. And um, so that's super frowned upon in Cambodia. Okay. Like, he's not going to be open about that. Oh. So his gun's at me, and he's like, um, eventually I start saying no. and. The translator is like, he feels insulted by what you did around the pool. So he says, you have to go to back to his house. Oh, shit. So the gun's still on the table. I'm freaking out. I was a little tipsy before. Now I'm 100% sober. Yeah. So I'm looking back at my friends at the bar, and they're all looking at me like, like is Josh okay? What's happening? <laughs> so I make a little signal for like one guy to come. He comes. Uh, he spoke a little Cambodian. So he gets me away from the table. Ooh, um, Good man. The translator comes back to me and is like, the police chief doesn't appreciate you leaving. So he says, tomorrow morning, he wants, or sorry, tomorrow night, he wants to come back and you have to go with him. Okay. So I'm like, fuck, what do I do? <laughs> like, there's a gay police chief. There's a gun pointed at me. I've never had a gun pointed at me before. Yeah. It's a real gun. Um, and I just know how much corruption there is. Like, he could, he could probably just kidnap me if he wanted to. Yeah. Take me back to wherever he lives and, you know, have his phone, have his phone with my booty. <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> I talked to the guys there and they're like, yeah, he's very corrupt. Um, sounds like a dangerous situation. You got to go. You got to get out. So of I it. got up at 4 a.m. First bus out of the city. I was gone. Holy, like we're laughing about this now, but like. I'm laughing about it now. Yeah. And in the moment, first, it was scary. I was like, he's okay. But, <laughs> but <laughs> he's thinking alive. back, because you don't know the outcome of, you you can't predict that you'd be here telling us this story. Like being in that moment. Like, what the fuck, man? Yeah, what how was that gun moment? Like, did you shit bricks? Did Are you, like, good oh, under pressure kind of thing? Oh, man, I, sh- I shot my pants. I was, I've never been so scared. I was shaking, like, yeah, like yeah. no kidding. You know, if you're, you know, when your legs are shaking when, I don't know, you're giving a public speech or something? <laughs> Adrenaline. Just, yeah. Whenever you're scared. Yeah. That's what, man, my whole body was shaking. I was trembling. Like, it's almost like you're cold. Like, you're, like, you have so much adrenaline. You're just, like. Exactly. Yeah. Like, such an adrenaline dump. Like, On it, top of that, a gun pointed at me and some homosexual police commissioner. Well, that's that's mm-hmm. terrifying because, like, if he really did want to pursue whatever he was trying to pursue, he would have li- probably no pushback from anyone around. Like, he's the police commissioner, or whatever. Like, that's uh, Jesus Christ, man. That's kind of terrifying. That's that's one of my strangest stories. Like, it doesn't e- even when I tell the story today, and I haven't thought of it in a long time. Mm. But it doesn't sound real. Like the aspects of it, the homosexual police commissioner or police chief. <laughs> Like drunk at a hospital on <laughs> a gun and a floaty and do, dancing around a pool. Like, Damn, you must have been a you must have done a good job running around that pool. <laughs> He's like, I want that one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucked up, man. Well, I'm happy you're here to tell the story and not back over there with him. Who knows what that would be like? Yeah, I mean, again, though, it's just a, another part of traveling. Yeah, like, you just embrace those experiences. Yeah, I mean, you. It, there, there's this kind of go with the flow when you're not at home. You know, you're in a foreign country, and I mean, foreign to you anyway. And I had a, I had a similar, no guns, but I had like a similar experience in India. And this guy was like being very physical and very aggressive, and he was like a forty, fifty year old man, and he was like, he was a bear. Like he was such a not in not in the gay term, but I mean, he was like a big <laughs> dude. He was just very like he could have bear hugged me. He could have grabbed me, and I would have been like screwed. Like he was a very yeah. like his forearm was like twice the size of my forearm, and he was getting really like gropy and touching me like it, like touching my dick like really being like uh, uh, like super aggressive and I just started walking fast I was like buddy, and he he 
he gave up, you know, but I was just like, did that just happen? Yeah. Like, I, d- I don't even know to this day. I don't really know what the culture is. Like, I don't know what the gay culture is or if there's a lot of like, just don't like, uh, you know, uh, hatred or pushback or homophobia in India. I assume there is. But I'm maybe that's just fucking racist. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, he yeah, he didn't. Uh, it was like it was under the veil of night. You know, it was one of those like, I'm just going to keep walking and you're going to give up. Get the hell out and of that. then it took me like a few days to be like, wait, that actually happened. That guy was really being like physically aggressive. And it was like it was just me and him in like a dark alley kind of <laughs> thing. And very uh, uncomfortable, it sounds like. Yeah, but like, I mean, like I said, no gun, you know, but like, I just, it feels surreal. You just kind of, you're like, you're like, oh shit, no, that really happened. Like, that was yeah. rapey. Like, that was fucked up. And uh, it, you know, my, my second or third thought was like, imagine being a, a chick and just like being in a foreign country alone. And I actually, I have a friend who kind of inspired me to go to India and she was traveling alone and she's kind of like short. She's kind of just like small. And she totally went in alone, and everyone that saw her was like, who is this white girl just walking around this country all by herself? Like, are you crazy? And it just seems like it gets safer and safer as time passes, as tourism becomes more prevalent and stuff like that. But uh, like I say, man, I, don't, mm. I, don't, it's, I can't imagine how you feel. Like, to this day, it doesn't feel real. Like you said, you know, it's like it's crazy. Oh, 100%. Man. It feels surreal. Yeah. yeah. Very surreal. And you have a handful of stories like that, you're saying. That's kind of, that's fucked up. I mean, you've been traveling a long time. I guess it's inevitable, but it's not even traveling anymore. It's just your way of life. I don't even know if you'd call it traveling. I guess you've kind of thrown but just, roots. You know, one thing you realize is that when you're out of, especially North America, just life is very different. Like customs are different. And stuff that we think is fucked up is maybe normal. Yeah. Like, for example, like where I, where my, where I am right now talking to you guys, I'm in a rural community. Like I just moved outside the city a few months ago. Just COVID made me realize like, fuck, I can't be in a city. I want to be, I want to have nature. Yeah. So here they have indigenous justice. So any crime that's committed, the police don't have a say in what the punishment is. So like, so let's say someone steals a car. You'll probably be in your underwear, walking through the street with hundreds of people on both sides, whipping you. Um, the name's escaping me, but there's a plant that when, you, when, you, when it touches your skin, it just gives you like unstoppable itching and pain. Okay. Um, like a sting nettle type thing. Mm-hmm. So that's just one difference. That's normal. Like that's normal for me now. To see indigenous justice or hear of it at least. That's crazy. It's like once a week, there's just like a guy <laughs> being flogged. No, it doesn't. It doesn't happen <laughs> often. I mean, it, it happens often in the news, but some guy will steal another guy's pig or cow, <laughs> and the community will just fuck him up. Like they'll they'll beat him up. Um, they'll use whatever plants will will make him comfortable. So that's normal. I love that they use plants. I just I don't know why that makes me happy. It's like here, it's like drink this, and like you're gonna puke for three days or something. It's like. <laughs> But like my ayahuasca I think I, oh my god that's you know maybe that's a good anyway I, 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 I'm just wondering are, is it all good after or did it, is it like, it's like we're gonna we're gonna like whip you and make you and embarrass you but like all is forgiven after mostly mostly oh. I think they'll impose punishments on your family even or oh. or like further punishments down the line but they're not gonna kill you oh, that's good so that's the good news what would be like a, a punishment that they would kill you they don't just don't do that I mean, I would assume murder. I, mean, I would mm. assume if you kill someone, you're probably going to, they're probably going to kill you too. Jeez, mm. I hope you don't have to see any of that. Yeah, yeah. But that's one of the cool things about Ecuador is there's lots of indigenous folk and the indigenous people have their own laws, their own land. Mm. So it's like two, having two different societies. You have like the ones who are mixed, like the mestizos is what they're called. Like the Europeans came and they mix with the, um, like with the indigenous blood. So now the people look more European, but then you also have lots of indigenous. There's millions in Ecuador, wow. and those people have all their own rules and 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 um, what the government says doesn't necessarily govern what they do in their lifestyle, which is pretty cool. That's kind of awesome. It's kind of preserved. Pretty awesome. Very preserved. That is cool. You mentioned ayahuasca. I have. It begs the question: Have you had a? Had you had any experiences with an ayahuasca ceremony up in the? Ecuador, or I should say down in Ecuador. I knew the question was coming. It has to come in. <laughs> no, I I want to. I've mm. been scared. I'm sure it's probably that, that you know that first time little scared. Little fear you of what's fucking happen because I never you left I've Canada, never man. Psychedelics. Okay, okay. Oh, and that would be your first. You know what? That's honestly, it's nice to have. I, I just just speaking from personal experience, it's it's all unique, right? But I feel like it's it. I, there's a little less fear knowing what you're getting into, but there's 
I still had the same fear taking something new and mm. trying something and just being like, I don't know what I'm in for. Maybe even more because I've tried other stuff. And then once I was in the space, I was like, oh, this feels kind of familiar. But all of that being said, maybe with a bit of ignorance, I would feel like ayahuasca is a really good first one to try because there's something kind of kind about mm. it. And even if it's being a little like heavy handed with you, it's always in a good way. There's always some kind of motherly thing. It's very hard to explain. Yeah. But I feel like if you have a nice surrounding, a good set and setting, a lot of like, um, I almost want to say like good reviews. Like I know you might not get like a Yelp review for for like some ayahuasca in Ecuador or something. Yeah. But if 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 the people, if this person has a good reputation and they know what they're doing and and you feel safe and comfortable, that all of that goes a long way as well. Yeah. But like, I'm only saying this because you you sounded curious. You're like, I I do I'm like I want to, but I'm scared. That's that seems like a common thing. I didn't want to. I, I felt like I wasn't scared, and I was like, I'm not really interested. And this guy just kind of coaxed me, <laughs> and I realized that I kind of did want to and was scared. <laughs> so I like if you have that vibe, like I hope you find it and go for it. I, I, I'm I'm so sure it'll be. What was your What was your first experience? I want to hear both uh, about both your first times doing it. Then, uh, well, okay, I'll try to be short, but like I. I I went with this guy. It was beautiful. <laughs> Him being there was really cool. So if you have a friend that goes with you or if you get to know the people there first, I think that would go a long way. And uh, I was the setting was amazing. It was really nice. It was all set up for us. There was food and, and uh, the people were very kind and uh, answering any questions you want. And everything was like very chilled out. And the plan was kind of set beforehand. And uh, the experience itself was, like I said, maybe not so surprising in terms of this kind of familiar feeling of other psychedelics. But at the same time, I didn't know what I was getting into. And it was weird to be in like a real ceremony for the first time, I might say, Mm. uh, because other times it was more recreational and and it was cool. It was really nice to have that ceremonial aspect. And I just felt weird. I felt kind of shy. And there was all this ego going on. And then, like, the first person to puke just made me feel okay. Like, everyone was being really vulnerable mm. and stuff. And and the, the, it's very it was very visual when I closed my eyes. And then when I opened my eyes, like, they're dancing and singing. And the shadows are moving around because there's a candle in the middle of the, the room. And, like, it was just crazy, man. I could go on, you know. Yeah. And then <laughs> it's funny because the second night... Um, I I felt like the first night was really intense and I just needed to like rest a little bit and, and kind of integrate what I was ex- what I had experienced. And I only took one cup instead of taking like three or maybe more if you want. And it hit me just as hard. It was it was like it was like it doesn't matter what you want. You know, I think I had the I have the feeling in retrospect, if I took no drink at all the second still, time, it's still something still would have come up. Yeah and uh yeah man it's like entities things will talk to you like i don't i don't want to give you too much you know i want you to have your own kind of un um like your own honest experience you know but uh, i i i loved it i i do i want to go back but i'm scared and i've done it before i'm still scared you know like it's just yeah. intimidating and it's well, like that fear uh, is healthy that fear is um it helped a lot when you told me that it's always, it's still there for you. Yeah. Like you're just like, challenging look, your ego. It's really I've, I don't know how many times I've drank in the cup, but I'm just as terrified of, as drinking it the next time as the first time. Yeah. yeah maybe it, even more sometimes. Yeah. You're like, what is going to happen now? You know? Uh, right? yeah. So yeah, what was your first time? Then? Yeah. Uh, wow. We're going back in Can memory lane. Can you remember lane. it? Yeah. yeah. No, I, I'll never forget it. That. Yeah. What year was this? 2017. I actually was planning on going to uh, Peru or Brazil. And I was talking about it with a friend at yoga. Instead of jujitsu, it was at yoga. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what's it called? The, the yoga teacher, my buddy Carl, overheard me talk about ayahuasca. And he's like, he's like, dude, uh, I'm going to ceremony. I'm like, oh, yeah, where? He's like, in Quebec. Like, we were just talking about going to Brazil, me and my buddy. And this guy is talking about ceremony in Quebec. And I, that's the connection to find this place. So uh, fast forward, I went to my ceremony in Quebec with, with the yoga teacher, Carl. And it was phenomenal. But it was very clear. It was a two-night ceremony, and they drink ayahuasca. Um, like Sammy said, you have three services throughout the night. So you everyone drinks the first cup. You wait about like an hour, and then we go for the second cup. It's always optional after the first. And then another hour or so, you can take a third cup. And I just remember the first night was just my entire life. I think I even said this on the podcast, but it doesn't matter. I'm sure. we. Yeah. Absolutely. My entire life was just laid out in imagery so 
it almost looks like if you zoom out on your phone into your album and you just see all the pictures like just pasted, you know, and and you can kind of click pictures in your timeline. It was kind of like that, but all those images were moving. It was just like moments in my life. And it was in a tree. It was in a giant tree. Like the whole tree was that. And I was just looking. And then it started to zoom in on different branches of the tree of traumas or some things that happened in my life. Didn't have to be big or small. It was just moments that were memorable, good and bad. And it just showed that some of those branches were tangled up. And what happened was, was ayahuasca, you know, most people report speaking with like a mother-like figure, or like a snake or something. But I remember something was speaking with me and just helping me untangle every tangled up branch. And I remember this was really deep because I actually broke down into tears during ceremony. It was just, it went back to like a memory I had when I was like seven or eight years old. Something super s small. My mom said something to me about something and instantly made a little tangle in that branch. And that formed like a life pattern of just habits based off of that moment of pain that I just carried on till now. And it kind of, wow. yeah, so it kind of brought me back to like eight years old, a decision that happened that literally made a habit grow from 10, 15, 20 years later. And it kind of untangled that. And I came to terms and peace with that moment. And then like the whole branches opened up and then it went to another one. And the whole night it was just going through branches that are all these little tangles and untangling the knots. And it was very, very intense. It was hard, but it was like, it was as if there was a therapist with me looking in my mind with me. So I, I didn't feel alone. I felt very um, accompanied. But then the second wow. night was completely different. Yeah, the second night was no visuals. I drank the same amount and it was just a physical purge. I was throwing up for four hours straight, just puking. And it was basically taught me that it divided day one was psychological day two is physical so glad that didn't happen to me yeah. and it was just like telling me you got to clean up your body like you've been treating your, sh your body like shit like this is this has to come out and i remember when i got back i took literally f six months of plant-based diet like i ate meat once a week and it wasn't that meat is bad it's just i i felt what i was abusing and i felt what i was lacking so it was just vegetables and fruits and like good quality stuff for six months and i just purified my body in that sense yeah. So, that, so I'm curious, like you talked about that moment when you were seven or eight. Yeah. Prior to doing ayahuasca, have you had you ever thought of that moment as being significant or was that the first time it clicked in your head? You know, it's funny you ask that. Like that moment kind of popped up like it's a memory, like I'll always remember it. So there's probably moments in my life. I'll just explain the moment. It's nothing. It's honestly, it's so stupid. But it, when you're a child, it's so meaningful. Mm -hmm. It was uh, I was in high. It was in elementary grade one or two. And my mom came in to volunteer to teach a group of us how to tie our shoes. So she took me and four girls or three girls, I don't remember the exact number, and she brought us to go tie it. And the girls figured out bunny ear, bunny ear, wrap around, loop and pull, you got your shoes tied. And I just you do the two bunny ears. Yeah. I don't like that. I do the loop around and pull. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm a two bunny ears guy. Bunny ears <laughs> is the best way to go. Yeah. So I just, for the life of me, couldn't figure it out. These girls got it first try. Boom. Beautiful shoes tie. You've never seen someone tie their shoes that nice. Me, I'm just struggling with the bunny ear. And I remember my mother's frustration. She was just so frustrated that I wasn't able to get it. And the girls got it. And I guess it hit her ego. Like, this is my son. And he can't figure it out. And she just like, she, I don't remember what she said, but she just, I felt the disappointment more than the words, you know? Mm -hmm. And it fucked me up, man. It really fucked me up. And I remember I was trying for like a week or two after to tie my shoes properly. And then I finally got it after like a week and a half, two weeks. And I show it to her and she barely acknowledged it. She's like, it took you two weeks, you know? And I hold nothing against her. It's just something that stuck with me and something that hurt. But if we fast forward to today, I notice a lot of my patterns are based off of that moment. Like I obsess over things and I try to get really good at it. And I never feel validated from that kind of work. I just feel like it's never good enough. And it roots back to that. And it's not that ayahuasca changed that. It's just I accept that and understand it and I can give myself more compassion, you know? Yeah. yeah it's but pretty... you know, what you're talking about is that's such a seemingly insignificant moment. Yeah. Like your mom, does your mom remember telling she you She will never remember that. It was just a moment for her, you know? And yeah. for a child, that can be life-changing. Right, but I'm saying it's incredible and you guys probably know this better than I do having experienced ayahuasca. How many like seemingly moments like that that, that seem like nothing, just... Just a um, a mundane moment, yeah. but how that may affect the rest of your life. And I think of that too of how certain decisions you take, and even though in the moment it seems like ah whatever you know I pick A or B doesn't matter, 
Um, but that definitely has an effect like later down the road. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And then why I find ayahuasca so valuable for me and for others is that it goes back to those initial moments mm. and it kind of allows you to have a second chance at it to clean it up. Cause yeah, the time passed, it happened. It's done with, you can't change the past, but you can change your response to the past. And then that's where a lot of people get stuck in their patterns is that they, they become victim to that and forget the power they have of changing it. You know, so you don't have to do ayahuasca to realize these things. But for me, that was my tool to just go back to that baseline and just kind of pat myself on the head and say, it's all good. You know? Well, how about this? If you guys come visit both of you, <laughs> my first time over you with you guys in the Ecuadorian Amazon. I would love that brother. I can I probably would, find I us a love that. Yeah. That would be sick. Because of this podcast, we've just connected with so many people around the world and a lot of shamans. I know there's a few in Mexico that we spoke with, but I can probably find us a really good connection in Ecuador. You probably can at this point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have tons of friends who've done it and, and I definitely know some people who, who can hook us up with a shaman. Okay. But Ecuador Ecuador is sixty percent rainforest. Wow. There you have it. So more than half the country is rainforest. So there's so much cool like jungle vibes and and mm. jungle and jungle um, just nature going on in the country. Well, that's it, and that's where usually those ceremonies take place is in the Amazon, and that's the origin of it, and that's where ayahuasca vine is. And it was always been a goal of mine to just experience the they call it the mother plant there in the in the, the in its purest environment. I, I actually want to switch this around to you and ask you why you want to experience ayahuasca or what's this curiosity? It comes from just people like you. Like I've met people here who've done it, talked to people like you, obviously. And every, like many people seem to have a profound enlightenment. I don't know if that's the right word to use, but many mm. people say it reveals just unexpected things about your life or your path in life. Mm. So that's, that's the main, uh, just curiosity, honestly. Yeah. Like that's my main reason for wanting to experiment with it. You know, uh, our the guy we do ayahuasca with, he, lo he he always gives a beautiful speech beforehand, but he says what ayahuasca will do is will shine a light in every corner of your mind. It's just going to have the whole mind lit. And whatever's been hiding in any corner is going to be revealed. And that can be a terrifying moment, but it could also be a big moment for healing and, and acceptance because now everything's on the table. And what's left to do when everything's in front of you is just to honestly accept it. You know, and that's why you hear these stories. People have enlightening moments is really just that they come to terms with their past. They come to terms with traumas and they, they, they come in a place with no ego. The ego comes in and judges. But when you take an when you go into an ayahuasca experience, that ego kind of dissolves. Mm. So imagine looking at your traumas and, and pasts without that judgment voice, without that talkative head, talking head saying, oh, look at you did. You're so bad, blah, 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 whatever. And it allows a deep level of compassion and healing. And that's why you hear so many stories. And that's why I think it's so valuable is because not many people have ever experienced that kind of lens without judgment, you know? And, you know, a big thing here, you guys probably could educate me about this, is San Pedro. Hey, we just did a podcast on it. Did you? Hachuma, yeah. It's the cactus. So what's, what's the difference between San Pedro and, and ayahuasca? So I've never experienced it, but I know from the description from our previous guest is that ayahuasca is like a motherly figure. It's a very maternal type of feeling of like healing and, and repairing and warmth and, and comfort. And Hachuma and San Pedro, they describe it more as the fatherly figure, the, the masculine energy. And that's more about um, connecting to your heart and drive and just experiencing like... Uh, almost euphoric in a sense it's just more of like being super connected to the moment not so much about the past that's at least what i got out of it i can picture it you know like when you're taking lower doses of uh, of shrooms or something yeah. you kind of have this like doing being and there's this lightness to it you know like if you take some dmt or like ayahuasca it's it's like you're very internal and and you get to experience it's, it's all about you and and it's all about and it's about your past and then you have like I have I have a lot a lot I can relate to with your experience, yeah. but it's it's the same same but different. There's a lot of uh, ancestral mentality, a yeah. lot of uh, just uh, indifference to your negative feelings about yourself, and just yeah. kind of focusing on 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 who you are and all these interesting things. 
And I feel like that can be described as very feminine energy or very um, motherly, like you're saying. Yeah. And then, and then this masculine fatherly vibe can be like, um, what's a good example? I don't want to say like you know pushing the kid in the in the water to teach him how to swim, something like that, but better, <laughs> like something <laughs> nicer. I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah that's I, I don't I don't know if I know what I mean. It's yeah. like I'm trying to think of of examples. That's yeah, and that's our interpretation because we d- we never experienced it. But that's true. We're talking yeah. shit. <laughs> but but from what we <laughs> but from what we understand, at least from our psychedelic experience, it's more of just like. Um, it's less about like repair and more about just like experience the moment. At least that's what I got. And that's why they do like San Pedro, they usually do it in daytime and they go for a hike Mm -hmm. and they, they experience nature and just feel super connected to the, to the environment and the, and the, the rainforest. And then ayahuasca is usually done more at nighttime and that's more of connecting inwards and fixing the inner forest and untangling those branches. Like I had, literally the sun and the moon yeah exactly i, I think yeah. i could see exactly this being versus doing yeah if i could really put it simply yeah i know you it's very know, popular I'm over like, there go ahead i well, know it's popular so i was going to say that like i'm a bit of a i like history like I, and living here there's so much inca history mm. yeah. and before the incas there was a canary culture so the incas were into all the psychedelics like there's a festival today called inti rami inti means sun and i, I forget what rami means but it's the festival of the sun and people just do San Pedro all the day in nature. Yeah. And they do it at the heart of where the Inca empire used to be. It's a place called Inga Pirca. It's an hour and a half from where I am now. Wow. And it's beautiful. Like it's 500 years old or 600 years old. And that used to be the center. Like you could do a tour there. And the cool thing about Ecuador, it's not touristy. So you do a tour there and it's a tour guide with like four people mm. and no one else is on the grounds. So you have like acres and acres and acres of beautiful Inca land. You can see their structures, their houses, um, just like unlimited cool shit to see. That's that's awesome, especially if you're yeah. if you're down with history. You're like, oh. So what I was getting at is the Incas have three, like they have three main animals. They have the condor, they have the snake, and the puma. Mm. So the condor is the heavens. The snake is is um is like hell, like the underground, and then the puma is everything on earth. Mm. So you could even see, like, you could go to the museums here and you could see, like, gold pumas or gold gold condor, um, like, headdresses that they used to wear. Mm. And lots of them talk about seeing all that stuff or being connected when you do San Pedro or when you do ayahuasca. It's funny you say that because ayahuasca usually, not always, but reported worldwide is people encounter a serpent, like this crazy kind of geometric snake with organic feathers coming out of it you hear that across the across the globe of of, of accounts and i've experienced the snake too and it's just these depictions of like animal human god type figures that they worship it's like we, we spoke to a guest pre, uh, recently about like the secret drugs of buddhism like there are these depictions of these gods animal human type of figures mostly came from a psychedelic experience you know it's just like this yeah and how, how cool is that it's it's phenomenal and, and like in india like the the gods like ganesh the elephant with like the four arms or whatever and and kali and they're all super psychedelic anyone who's done psychedelics will be like yeah that's that's i've seen that yeah <laughs> it's it's very interesting and there's a deep culture behind these these medicines you know in ecuador they call san pedro they probably call it medicine because it really is a medicine you know they use it in a very certain Going back to what you asked me before, like that's another reason I want to try all this mm. ayahuasca, San Pedro psychedelic stuff. It's just because of the history of it. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you said that because I forget sometimes, and I, we actually mentioned it yesterday with the ketamine guy. But like, there's, I feel like there's this imprinting of everyone who's like taken it as well. I feel like there's so much history that you kind of experience in the trip, mm. and it's like I said before, I don't want to like inform your trip, but like it's kind of inevitable. You've yeah. heard some stuff or you've seen some stuff, especially you, you're, you're a history buff. Like, But even if you didn't, I feel like there would be so much like information somehow packed into the, the trip itself, into the medicine, into the plant somehow. Yeah. I don't understand how or why, but it just seems to be how you s- everyone sees the same things. And it's really cool to think of that way. You're getting like a kind of history download in, a, in an interesting way. Yeah. Well, that, that that's mind-blowing for me. Like, I think... Maybe it was on Joe Rogan. I know you're a fan of Joe Rogan, Nate. Yeah. I remember once on his podcast, he was talking about <laughs> I roll. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it, right? <laughs> but he was talking about P- 
people that experience ayahuasca and seeing the same thing at the same time, yeah. like the same, the same psychedelic images. Yeah. How, how does that make sense? That, and uh, there's a guy, Kyle's Kinsbury. He has a podcast. He's been on Aubrey Marcus's podcast a few times, but okay. he spoke about, uh, he went to an ayahuasca ceremony with his wife or fiance at the time. And they were trying to get pregnant. They were trying to have a child and they weren't able to. And they did the ayahuasca ceremony together in, in a ceremonial setting. And a, this is his account, so I'm going to butcher it, but I'm going to paraphrase it. Basically, him and her experienced the exact same trip where they were giving birth to their future child together. And they were both holding this this energetic baby together and wow. seeing it and breaking down and crying and holding each other. And then, lo and behold, they actually she got pregnant not too long after. But these joint experiences are actually very common. And it's, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know if there's an explanation, but it happens. And there's a lot of data that solidifies this because it's, it, how can you describe that other than magic? You know, it's a magical experience. Yeah, you just have accounts like you don't have, you don't know how or why it works, but like a bunch of people, a bunch of like, you know, very practiced people take these things in some ceremonial sense and some traditional sense and they're all in a room yeah. and they're all chanting and they can see the shapes their chants are making and they're talking about it like it's normal they're like oh i like how you said this and it was this shape and like that one had a weird shape and you kind of fucked up and they're like yeah yeah i saw that one like is this just like a shared uh -huh. psychosis or something <laughs> or like it maybe you're cracking something open and just it's all it's something that's there it's something that's real but it's just hard to see and then when you take some molecule suddenly it's, it's right in front of your you. face yeah and i think it's important if you do go to a ceremony and hopefully we do actually do it with us i would love to come down there and do this um yeah, ditto. but it's important to strip away the skeptic mind and use that mind after the fact because to fully allow the experience in is to fully experience so if you go in with the skepticism, it might be just a, another bridge that you're going to have to cross. And it, it could be like that skepticism could take like seven ceremonies to get over. So going in with the idea of just whatever happens, happens. I don't need to understand it in the moment will maximize your experience because sometimes you can go in with all these expectations or all these judgments and all these like, like um, reality shattering ideas that you're not willing to accept and that can be detrimental to the progress because whether or not it's real or not it can impact and change your life for the better so going in with that intention is so powerful and it gives the medicine service and it gives you more service that's good advice but coming from like me someone who's never done who's never had experience like this it's just hard to to get rid of your preconceived notions yeah it's just you're human it's just in your head of, like you're like what's going to happen to me i'm going to be okay what am i going to see for sure and that's fine i think that's part of it too yeah. like I, I have a lot of just that normal natural anxieties in life and i feel like they come out so much at the beginning of any trip mm. and it's part of my ego just kind of like tiring itself out yeah so it's like if if you can know that that's going to happen and you're going to have some kind of uh you know nervosity some kind of like natural anxiety then you can just kind of t make some space in between it instead of trying to maintain it or control it or stop it you're just like okay this this is i'm putting a thing in my body i'm taking the plane i'm taking the plane ride i'm in the seat it's the, too the late ticket though. is bought yeah you're going for <laughs> it and i feel like because you're you're a traveler like in by nature you have it's the same idea it's why it's why it's why we call it a trip you're just going to go somewhere right. you're going to dive in you're going right. to have that same muscle where you're just like let's yeah. do this and maybe that's why you want to try it as well is just to change things up to better yourself to see who you are in a new environment you know it's an it's a it's not as simple as curiosity. I think it really resonates with you because you're you're that kind of person where you're like, let's shift reality. Let's see what else is real. Let's go for it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good way to put it. It's I mean, especially after talking to you guys, it's just a matter of time. Mm. Like whether it's this year or this month, it's gonna happen. Yeah. Exactly. I'm actually talking to some to some Amazon lodges now about doing a video series. Nice. Like a local living video series in the Amazon. Oh, so that'd probably be a cool thing to to add to that. That's cool. Oh man, it would be so funny if you made like a funny video <laughs> of that. Like you just, it's like you before, and you're all like, Meh, and then you after, and you're just staring at the camera or something, <laughs> like with a wide eyes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would kill me. That would kill me. Yeah. yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, <sighs> you know, um, where did I want to go with this? It'll come back. Yeah, it'll come back. I just, yeah, I don't know. These uh, these experiences, if 
for me, my biggest thing was just having that idea that that's out there and that could be experienced. That was my initial curiosity. It's just like there's more to this reality, at least in terms of what people are reporting. It's like life's a video game. Yeah. It's like, holy shit, there's like a whole other level. Yeah. (laughs) I can like relate this to just traveling, like hearing about Thailand, be like, oh, what? This, that, the food, like on the street food, like like everyone's walking around. There's no traffic lights. There's just chaos. I, I need to experience that. Knowing that that exists, that was my initial curiosity. And then the real question started surfacing up after I started working with it. But that, like, for people out there, like, the fear is always going to be there. Fear is there when you travel to the next location. You know, these fears are really important because these are reminders that you're alive and you need to take danger into account. And without fear, you're just kind of ruthless and and not worth it in a sense because if it's not scary, it's kind of what's the point kind of thing, you know? Right. So, so it's good to, it's very healthy to have these fears. And I, okay, now it came back to me. Um, there's one thing that when you decide to do a ceremony, I told Sammy this too. I'm like, the ceremony begins the moment you say yes. And now leading up to it, you're going to get like these little voices that are going to come in your head be like, oh, I don't need this shit. I don't want to go poison my mind. And then usually the week before ceremony, it's like your mind is like shuffling through the folders and it's looking through your life. And that's... any excuse to get out of it. (laughs) And it gets so funny, the things you say to yourself in your mind and the rationale you make about not going. It's so funny. But I usually say is the more afraid you are, the better the experience will be. Because it's like it's like anything. It's like a jiu-jitsu match. When you go to a competition, you're terrified. But when it's done, you're so proud of yourself, you know? But you, you know, my, my question is, like, for example, when you have a cool experience in life, let's say you travel, you come back, and you're excited. You have the adrenaline. You want to you wanna try to, let's say, be more open of a person or experience new things. But eventually that dies down. Yeah. Like, eventually you just go back to status quo. Yeah. So with something like ayahuasca, do you guys think that it stays with you for the rest of your life? Or does it have a dip? I, like not other necessarily. I love that you brought that up. I feel like it's the same thing. It's not going to like change you magically. Yeah. Like it's just a, an experience. And if you don't integrate it or, or work with it, it might just kind of slip exactly. through your hands, even if it might be Sweet. slowly. And yeah, I'll, I'll even... Same thing. It's yeah. so cool that you brought that up. And I think it's a very crucial and important point because it could actually cause more damage if you go back to your old habits because now you're back to your old habits, but you're aware of them. And you're aware of the habits that were toxic to you. And if you don't change those, it could actually cause like a depression. In a sense, it's happened to me a few times where I didn't, I I, I had like these we call it downloads, these moments of like intense information mm. about yourself, about your patterns, and then you go back to regular life and you you don't do it. Then you know now it's like you see, you see something and then you're just doing it. You under you're you're kind of aware of your inactivity towards it. So that can be quite hard. So. It's like anything. When you come back, you have to do the work that was in in that experience. You have to kind of integrate it. Yeah. And the, the reason I ask that is because I've met some assholes here <laughs> and they're bragging about their experiences. But then I'm like, isn't this supposed to, to minimize your ego and level you as a person? And <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? I yeah. think it bruises your ego and then you can it can come yeah. back with force. But I, I'm, The spiritual I'm, ego is what forms though. Exactly. Oh, I'm. I take ayahuasca. Like it's a protection now. It's another layer. There's this. It's a crush. There's this really funny cartoon where there's like a guy jumping off this platform, and it says ego, and he's like, "I'm done with this." And then he hits another platform <laughs> not far down, and it says spiritual ego, and it's bigger, and it's like, it's like you're you're just falling for the same trap. The <laughs> ego is is this thing that's always gonna find the way, you know. Yeah. And I'd love your advice because that was so in line with a with a, a psychedelic trip, and you're using your information with like physical travel. How do you deal with that? Like like uh, like with physical with that physical like oh uh, do I do I integrate it? Do I live it? I mean, you've kind of been in this consistent travel, but like I said, or like you've you've you put your roots now in Ecuador a little bit. So like I'm I'm curious if there's a if there's like a how to get out of that or how to avoid that or if you've ever had any kind well, of post travel depression, I, I try to really be cognizant of of like how what I do affects other people. And honestly, doing this local living video series and seeing the reactions of people and like whether it's a small act of giving them a dollar or or buying them a meal, so I I try to be cognizant of of exactly how my actions reflect upon the world. Mm. So any any lesson I learn from traveling or any other aspect of my life, I try to make it better, not just myself, but other people. So, like, let's say, it's kind of hard to put this into words. Let's say, um, like, one lesson you learn from traveling is it's, if you don't talk to people, you're not going to make friends. Like, it's going to be a very lonely experience. There's lots of single travelers out there, and they're introverts. I'm introverted. I'm more introverted than extroverted. 
So like me talking to people takes more energy than some others. Mm -hmm. But I realized like talking to other people, you create cool connections and other people feel the same way as you do. Like I may be introverted and I talk to another introvert and that guy's like, fuck, I thought he was going to have no friends until you talked to me. Hmm. So then you're like, wow, like me putting myself out there makes someone else happy. So now like me, what I do for local living, every video I do um, tries to benefit like either a person or a business or some aspect of life here. So I, I don't just do stuff for views or, or like to get subscribers or, or make money. Like I want to, it's a little cliche, but I want to make like Ecuador a better place. I want to make the world a better place. I want to bring happiness to people. It's I know it's kind of one of those like woo-woo things people say, but that's what I actually try to do like through through my project now. Yeah, I don't think we see it that way anymore. I, I really, I, 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 it's it's worth pointing out. I think I used to hear it like that a lot, but I recently, I know COVID and a bunch of other stuff, like I recently just kind of came out of this like months long depression. And one of the things I found out was like, my life not might not be where I want it to be, but like I still have a lot of things I can manipulate and control. And I had to kind of find or like agree with or kind of realize this honest thing about myself is that I do want to help people. I do want to make the world a better place. And however cliche that is, I am here. I'm carving a path whether I like it or not. I may as well not bulldoze people and be an asshole. So it's like you ever, you know, that. It made me think of this thing uh, that I heard. It's like a butler giving advice. And he says, always have your hands full. You know, you walk in and you carry something, walk out carrying something as well. So it's like, you're going to make some fun videos. You're going to make people laugh. Why not also help people out? Why not? Really, why not? There's no and I'll just reason. tell you guys about the most recent video. Sure. Is I, got a, I got a really cool sponsor for this video. It's, it's going to come out next week. It's this guy from um, American Guy. He's a lawyer. And he started this cool organization called A Ripple. And do you guys know anything about Venezuela right now? Uh, I know it's it's a, a shaky little, time right yeah. now, but that's all I know. Yeah, that's that's put it easy, man. Like I think yeah. in the past five years, forty percent of the population has left the country. Jeez. Oh wow! I the read something crazy. Is ridiculous. I, like, I read the, something the crazy. That, salary is two dollars. Sorry, go ahead, Nate. No, I just read something crazy that like people are resorting to eating dogs and stuff because there's oh. there's such poverty. I don't know how true that was, but I just remember I was reading an article that it's really bad over there. That's probably one of the like the lesser bad things. Yeah. Like the the country's falling apart. Forty percent have left, something like that. Um, the monthly salary is two dollars, so families are literally having to leave. And the bus journey from Venezuela is fucked up. Like just to come to Ecuador, it could take months, it could take weeks, and it's like years and years of salary that are saved up to do this. Oh. So, anyways, wow. this American guy who sponsored this video, his organization is called A Ripple. And he tries to help people on the streets, like in, in Ecuador, and like specifically Cuenca, but but all over Ecuador. So I I did this video with this like really cool guy. He's from Venezuela, 60 years old, and he's a world-renowned doctor. He's an OBGYN, um, speaks seven languages, studied in Russia, has worked in Cuba, has worked in Europe, and now he's the Joker, like from Batman. I did a video where I dressed up as a Joker. I saw it. It was hilarious. And yeah. So I did that because I was like documenting what he does. So this guy's name is Jose Luis. And I think five days a week, he'll go to the center square of the town and dressed up as a joker and just dance around and act as a joker to make money. And if you talk to this guy, like zero ego, he doesn't like to be called doctor. Mm. Like if you call him doctor, he's like, like settle down, bud, you know? <laughs> um, so he's, he's doing this now to support his niece who's living with him and his niece's boyfriend. He's making like a few bucks a day, sometimes a little more. Um, but this guy has so much to offer the world, like so many skills. He's helped thousands of people like through, through his trade. He's 60 years old. So he's been doing this for like, let's say 35 years. Mm. And now because of what's happening in this country and not being able to practice in Ecuador, he's left as a joker in, in the city. Yeah, it's fucking humbling to say the least, but he's, yeah. he's cracking so at it. Stories like that, there's millions of them. Yeah, I can't imagine. I'm, I, I honestly have been avoiding the news for like more and more as the years pass, but I'm starting to feel like uh, I don't want to be too ignorant about what's going on either. And, and I, and like you said, you know, you brought up Venezuela and I just went like, yep, bad things are happening. Like, I don't remember. I just went like, yep, the, you know, the economy's falling apart. There's, there was riots and protests and, and now, and a, a lot of exodus, like you were saying, and, and I didn't realize it was like, Still going on, still horrible, still and and so many displaced people, and it's an it's an entire population, and like the people, 
entire families with with a beautiful skills to heal people or to to who know who knows what and they're just like relegated to you know like uh like destitute travelers who are who are like trying to make ends meet and and maybe living on the street probably living on the street it's it's heartbreaking i mean i'm the same way i mean positive news doesn't make money it's all negative headlines Mm -hmm. so i don't look at the news but you just you can't you can't feel a connection to what's going on in the world at least so i feel you can't feel a connection unless you meet the people like it's easy to say that there's something happening in yemen and yeah you feel bad but you don't actually understand you can't come to grips with what's happening because you don't know anyone from yemen so Like at least me, Ecuador is a third world country. So me living here and meeting a bunch of like refugees is making me understand like more, more of the world and getting a better grasp on, on, on the shit that's happening. Mm. That's a good point. Like I, we don't have to break our heads if we can't control it, but you can touch these people. You can help them in any way you can, you know, and you can talk to them, just get to know them. And, and it's part of your life. It's part of your circle. So, so then, yeah, why not? But but why worry about the other part of the the garden? You know, like you like you can't you can't touch it. You can't do anything about it. You're just gonna. I feel I it's it's a li- it's it feels egoic. It feels like uh, wrong to say, but it's like uh, you got to protect yourself a little bit. You gotta you can't just like stretch yourself out and and get all the knowledge. And it's just more of like a fear of just like I need to know everything and I need to be informed and not look stupid. And it's like yeah, but are you? Is it helping you? Is it helping you help other people? Probably not. Like just take a take a step back, be local. You know, uh, right. when Amber was on, I was listening yeah. to it recently. She said, "Think globally, but act locally." That's the coolest yeah. advice I've ever heard. Mm. Yeah, it's a cool expression. But I mean, just humans are so human centric. It's all about our survival, going back for millions of years. So mm-hmm. it's hard for us um, to focus on other people and other other shit that's going on because everyone has their own shit that's going on, right? Yeah. So like the the problem is how do you get yourself to 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 get the eyes off you and put your focus on what's going on around you, and that's something I'm still figuring out. I think practice just goes a long way though. It's like uh, there's a little leap of faith, and then you realize how impactful it can be and how rewarding it can be. And you could talk about it all day, but when as soon as you get into the momentum of anything, you know, it's just kind of the trick of being human is just some momentum, and then you realize you're like, oh. Like I'm still alive. I'm I'm not like starving or ruining my life because I'm thinking of this person before myself. And most of the time, you're going to think of yourself first anyway because you want to be, you want the tool to be sharp so that you can do your best. Of course, yeah. I think it comes down to what you were talking about before, also with things that you do have ripple effects and choices you make will have these impacts on everyone around you. And it can eventually, if you're a big enough audience, you can extend to the whole world. So I think uh, these small acts of kindness and purity and love and truth, these mom- these things that you decide to do from that kind of perspective and foundation, that's how you make change. And I think it's like things like what you're doing, as small as it may seem in the moment, might just be the answer long term as a ripple effect, you know, as bringing people together in unity and like the videos you're putting. Yes, they're funny. Yes, it's you trolling and have a big smile on your face. But what's really happening is you're connecting with these people and you're that connection is being viewed on YouTube now for anyone to see. And it's that, I think it's that level of humanity that once we see these connections, we start building a stronger, more compassionate uh, society. And I think the problem with the news is that they just put the worst of the worst out there. And it's most of the time unrelatable and most of the time just makes you scared, but it's not, there's no f- human connection in, in the news, in the news headlines. It's just X happened. And then you look at it, you get terrified and you move on. You know, right? And just to be clear, my videos aren't trolling videos. Those are only yeah. my short videos. I'm not, I'm I'm just being uh, I'm wording it wrong. I don't mean it in that way, but I mean it's like I mean it trolling in like in the best possible way. And maybe it's the wrong word, but I mean you're just having a good time, and everyone yeah. around you is having a good time. And at the same time, you're actually very informative. Like you're speaking their language, you're going up to these people, and you're some of them you're even getting their story, and you're just it's just. Trolling is the wrong word. I apologize for that, but it's really just like it's positivity, but it's it's more yeah. connected. It just feels like you're connecting in a pure way with these people. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, try. I try. I just call you a troll because uh, I've known you for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you, you use that word differently than other people. Yeah, I don't use so, troll in a, a negative way. Yeah. yeah. Wait, can we? So, how long have you guys been friends for? Five wow, years. Five years. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. So I've known I've known Nate man <laughs> since. <laughs> We've been neighbors for a long time because yeah. we live on the same street. We live next to each other. Yeah. 
and Nate oh, Nate went to my high guy. school. Yeah. He had, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm making some connections yeah. now. Yeah. Nate, Nate went to my high school. I think you just went to roll there for one year, right? Yeah. Terrible year. <laughs> I flunked. Can we, can, we, can we talk about your first year, though? Go for it, man. <laughs> this, do you know what I want to? Do you know what story I want to talk about? Uh, fighting Peter Copa. No. Oh no! no oh god! Peter. I don't know. Actually, about... maybe. <laughs> oh god! No, but we used to, we used to have the Fight Clubs, and yes, was the yes. fucking first guy to be, to volunteer for Fight Club as a twelve year old kid. <laughs> and I, I was watching this from the sidelines, and you guys were going at him, like full like, on like fights, hard punches, full on fights. We were crazy, fucking crazy. So this was my this is how I met Nate. Like this was my first time talking to him. <laughs> Get to know him a little. It's fight club. <laughs> him just lacing people. It's <laughs> funny you say that because when I went to Westmount High after, we formed another fight club and we got in big trouble with the principal and all that. And I was just, look, if people know me from back then, they see me in a different light than most people know me from now. And it's because of the inner work. I did a lot of change and 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 realizations, but I was this ego-driven little shithead. I can't even picture that guy. I mean, you just used to bullshit. You just used to, like, screw with me. <laughs> yeah. you, you just used to mess with me. That's the worst I've ever gotten from him, is just, like, lying a little bit. But, you, like, you, like fight cl- a fight club followed you from one school <laughs> to another. That's the kind of person you were. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was... <laughs> I, I caused a lot of trouble back in that school, but I it was really just because I didn't have much direction, and I didn't have too much rel- relatability with the the adults i didn't feel Mm. like they understood me and i didn't understand them and it came out it manifested in me being rebellious and violent and angry but then people feel that way at that age but that's why for me martial arts was the the catalyst into channeling that and getting rewarded because my violence became like controlled and excelled and got more technique behind it and then i was beating people in the class and they were beating me and we were just like this camaraderie of like brotherhood and it was just the it was like, oh, I'm not a bad person. It's just I had this energy that just never was channeled properly. And now we're doing martial arts and it's, we're hugging and we're laughing. And now it's a coveted skill. Yeah. And a brotherhood. Do you still train? Honestly, it's been a long time, especially because of COVID. Uh, the gyms have been closed here. I don't know what your situation is there, but here we've just been fully locked down for a year. Did you get my text, man? Come mm-hmm. over and teach me jujitsu. Let's do I it, I will man. pay you money. You don't even need to pay. I just want to roll. I will still pay you money. And then, funny enough, is that you ended up coming to our jiu-jitsu school, and we were training together yeah. for a long time, too. So it's just... And I've been training for... I think my first time training was 2013, so it's been eight years now for me. Wow. And you have a school there? Or yeah, I go. To, I train I train a few times a week here. Oh, that's awesome. amazing, man. What's your... I mean, yeah. I hate, I, I'm just curious. I don't know if I'm, like, insulting your honor or something, but, like, what's your, what's your belt or, like, what's your level? I'm purple belt. Nice. Eight years, man. I love yeah. jujitsu. Like every other, I've done a bit of Taekwondo. I did uh, Kung Fu. Did, the Kung Fu didn't have belts really, but like you, the progress seems so much faster. And jujitsu is like already such a humbling martial arts slash practice slash sport. But it's like, man, it takes a while to get a, a belt. Like just yeah. a fucking X, like the new step is so few and far True. between. Yeah. I call, I look at jujitsu as the science of martial arts because you come with a theory, you get peer reviewed, everyone tests your theory over and over again in the gym. And when I mean test your theory, I mean they're sparring you. So your theory is X move. I'm learning an arm bar. So you have to apply it in class. Everyone's testing it, destroying it, making you rebuild and strengthen your theory. And then that only happens through intense sparring over a long period of time because if your theory is never really tested, it's you don't know if it's effective. And that's why jiu-jitsu's journey is such a... For a black belt, that's usually about a 10-year-plus journey is because you have to have such a... By the time you're a black belt, you got to have like a thesis and a full 300-page essay explaining why you should have a black belt. And I'm talking in in not an actual essay. I'm talking more of in imagery. But that's the kind of level, yeah, that's the kind of level it takes to become a black belt. And when you have like karate schools or uh, taekwondo schools, you get a black belt in two years, but you've never really tested it. You never had like, yeah, (laughs) I know some schools, it's literally two years, you got your black belt. Pay to win kind of thing. And when you go to jiu-jitsu, you'll know right away the person's ranking if they're actually a black belt or not. It's it's a very interesting martial art and it's very humbling because it does take that 10-year grind. Oh man, it just crushes your ego too. Oh. And on top of the physical, the physical strain, man. And whenever you like, whenever I travel, the first thing I'll do is look up a jiu-jitsu gym because it's mm. so global now. It's I'll crazy. instantly go there. Hey, what's up? You're from Canada. So cool. And yeah. instantly you have like that's ten awesome. new friends. Yeah. So that's the coolest part for me. 
I feel like that with yoga a little bit. I feel like I could just be like, oh, I'm into that. And then it's like we can relate a little bit, but it's less of a camaraderie because it's such a kind of personal practice. There's a lot of things to relate on, but like you're literally grabbing each other and rolling on the ground and being careful to find that limit where you're you're going all out and you're using your mind and your body. And like, it's just a, a connection that I, I well, can only imagine. We honestly. take it for granted, but we're literally putting ourselves inches away from death and trusting that the other person will let go when you tap. Yeah, it's like, here's a little brain damage. And, but when you do Cha. that, <laughs> when you do that, it creates this bond where it's like, I don't know how to explain it, but you know what I mean. This jujitsu bond is like... It's the primal bond from just fighting and wanting to fuck each other up yeah, for, but for 10 minutes or however many minutes. Exactly. Like two dogs. In a friendly manner, funny enough. You're trying to kill each other for 10 minutes and then after you high five and hug and go to the next partner. I feel like video games are that outlet a little bit. We want to challenge each other and see what we're made of. And, and there's something just really fun about that. To even if you, whether you win or lose at the end, especially like, I, I'm sure you guys have had like a, like a brawl sometimes where you just like fight somebody, especially if it's a friend. And after a couple of swings and it gets too serious, like hopefully it just kind of dies down. And you have like this moment where you're just like, like in love with each other. You're just like, you're like, I respect yeah. you. I love you. Like we're better friends now. We, we know where we stand. And you're kind of, maybe uh, you know it's 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 a it's a spar you know like it's not the same but there is that it's a very male thing but i'm sure a lot of women experiences as experience experience it as, as well but it's just i don't know it's hard to even put into words it's like, like i like how you said primal. primal is the best way to put it yeah it's just going back to our and dna of just rolling around and fighting and you know one more thing the first time I ever got put to sleep was by that fucker, Nate. It's true. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just <laughs> memory I a, pop. I was a white belt. He was a purple belt. <laughs> this is why I want to pay. Arrow choke. Yeah, I want to. And tell my him. ego was like, I'm not fucking tapping in Nate. Like, fuck this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then, the next thing I know, like my legs are on top of my head. I'm like, why are you guys grabbing, grabbing my legs? Like, what the fuck? Look at my legs, gay boys. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we're trying to get you to wake up. Or something. Yeah, you were gargling <laughs> yeah. a little bit. I got terrified. You remember that though, eh? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> uh, I killed him. <laughs> yeah. That's, man, this is probably like at least seven, seven years ago now. Jeez. Are there more stories? I would love to. We're, 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 we're about the hour and a half. I don't want to go too much over your time here, but like, I would love more fucking. Uh, I got, I got time. Don't worry. <laughs> Are you good? Are you Expose good? me. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> if you have well, anything else. The other thing I wanted to mention about Fight Club, I actually, I told Nate about this years ago, and he actually didn't remember this. So. Maybe it'll come there back was this to guy, I'm not going to name names. Okay. But there was this kid in our class. It's always a good sign. And you remember back in the day when axe and axe and a, and a lighter used to be a thing? Oh, sure. That yeah, oh, was geez. a cool thing to do. Yeah, the flamethrower. So this, poor, this poor guy was in the corner, and he has axe and a lighter, and just <laughs> flamethrowing flame throwing him, whatever the word is. This, the poor guy's cut. He's not, he's not burning. It's the kind of person like he's like inches away from just having his whole fucking body burn. <laughs> <laughs> I was traumatized from this because the guy is screaming. He's like, stop, stop. <laughs> this guy's a phobia old. of fire now because of you. <laughs> oh, and man. Nate's obviously a wild, a wild kid at 12 years old. Yeah. So everyone's in the corner just watching this. And obviously <laughs> looking back, I'm like, fuck, I wish I would have pushed Nate or stopped this because <laughs> it was bad. It was bad. It's, it look, was like I, a hurt animal. Maybe I, maybe I uh, suppress this because I have no recollection of this. Yeah, this uh, I know because we, we talked about this back in the day yeah. and i was like hey nate you remember this time and you're like i swear i don't but that's how unconscious i was i just was not aware of any of my actions well what 12 year old really is but still if you do remember this guy's name tell me off air i want to send him an apology because that's <laughs> that's a probably i hope it's not we spoke about creating patterns from traumas i hope uh he's not um still a victim to this i don't know it's been it's been i haven't seen it since high school so it's 10 plus years now so yeah. hope he's okay <laughs> shit yeah so that's the kind of person i used to be <laughs> that is hilarious i mean we've all done some fucked up shit but like i don't have someone calling me out <laughs> so this is really fun for me right now <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah but, but i don't know it's, aside from that nate changed schools after so i don't have his i don't have stories like i'd see him on the street walking yeah um that's it. but that's about it i don't have any crazy stories from nate well yeah, i mean the stories continued maybe for three years in that high school and then i got a girlfriend in grade nine and she that changed everything. A bit. Yeah, she honestly really, we did it for seven years and that was just me like realizing that, oh fuck, uh, well that plus martial arts, but that was just like, 
a distraction. You know, there was another outlet, not just a distraction. I'm not going to push her down like that. It was a beautiful, well, a bit of a mirror. Too. Yeah. Like just say, why the fuck are you doing like someone being a little closer? Yeah. To you. And like holding me accountable, you yeah. know, and just me wanting to be a better version to be a better mate for this female. You know, if you go down to the reductionist, if that's what it's all about. And started acting more accordingly and less stupidity and less violent and less angry. That plus martial arts was just the perfect recipe. And then adding in psychedelics to reflect on all the stupidity, that's just uh, led me to this moment right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's like before those little decisions or the little things that happen in your life just end up accumulating over time and then you are where you are because of those. Yeah, and you know what? You got to accept it. You can't ignore that part of your life. You know, you got to come to terms with it. You know, I, I honestly don't remember that memory, but I remember the fight clubs and that stupidity. And I, it's kind of where I came from. And I have a reference point of who I used to be and where I am now, you know? Yeah, I guess we're all yeah. shitheads when we're younger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Those, Josh, those was, a, Josh was a pretty man. good now, dude. Now everyone would have their fucking smartphone. I'd be done. You, I'd be done. It would be a lot worse. Yeah, and that is a good point because I feel bad for kids today. Because, yeah, look, you can't expect the world of a 12-year-old. And if they got filmed saying something stupid or doing something stupid and that goes viral, their life is pretty much ruined. And there's no, there's no forgiveness in today's culture for some reason. It's just attack and destroy. I'm sure that's turning around a bit. I, I hope so. I feel like maybe there's a little bit of sublimation now of that, like, you know, being a shitty 12-year-old. Like, we all kind of get to, to have that. We have to have that. But you, but you, you feel like you're being watched, and there's pros and cons. But then you might just make less shitty decisions. Like you just might think twice at a younger age, and that kind of sucks because you want to go through. You, you want to make the mistakes. You want to get your hands dirty and really, and sometimes bleed and burn to really learn some hard lessons. And maybe you're foregoing that, but at least you're you don't you have less regrets. And then it, I'm sure that is at the cost of that point. one kid that makes the the big mistake, but and then it's following him for the rest of his fucking but, life. But the bad part is, is that children up until 25, even the frontal cortex is not fully developed, and that's literally the part of the brain, the prefrontal prefrontal cortex, is that allows you to see like six steps ahead to see the outcomes of your actions to so, suppress uh, yeah. in, uh, inhibition and, and yeah. yeah so you have like these 16 year olds that literally don't can't have the comprehension to think of their actions that are going to have ripple effects in 5 10 years you know and yeah. at least it's common knowledge now it's like <laughs> kids are always going to be shitty i know they're, they're just yeah, tiny yeah. humans yeah. <laughs> yeah. just for the internet it's not the it's not as compassionate but you know what's interesting cuz you keep bringing up how the small um actions or, or moments can can direct our lives and redirect our lives and i keep having this feeling and I, I can hear my brain saying like that's just when you're younger or something maybe it's more effective or stronger when we're younger because because it just feels that way maybe it's just an illusion because it's further in the past and we can kind of see the the, the cheminement like the the, ch the chain of events but but you talk about it it feels like it's it's all the time and and i feel like maybe for some reason i've been lying to myself like it, like these moments are less important maybe we're just always kids we're always just trying to be better and it's very easy to be forgiving um, especially nowadays or maybe just as we get older we get wiser and we realize everybody's just crazy and stupid and we're just kind of doing our best <laughs> no matter who we are well what i think is when you're let's say when you're 10 or younger like you just have such little life experience you live at your parents house so anything that happens just stays more with you. Mm. Um, like anything that's said, just mm. because of the nature, like your memory isn't even developed. Like I don't even know if I remember anything before six. Yeah. So let's say you're a 10 year old, you have four years of memories. So stuff stays with you. But then obviously as you go to school, high school, university, you start interacting with more people traveling and it just multiplies tenfold. So for me, it's not that I'm cognizant of every single interaction I have that has an effect later on, but I just try to, I just try to reflect a little. Like I'm like, wow, if I didn't see that YouTube video of the of that couple making their shitty YouTube videos, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't have had this big idea to help the community and help <laughs> help bring spotlight on some people and businesses as well. Yeah, I I'm, I feel compelled to ask you if you meditate. No, I don't meditate. It seems like you do. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm I, I'm a pretty Zen person. I don't even smoke that much weed. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just I've always been like this. I'm just a maybe more of a thinker. Yeah, maybe you have a cuz I mean you did you did kind of self-identify as an introvert. Like maybe you just take the time to maybe write or or maybe the videos as well are are kind of a chance to be self-reflective, but you 
you you seem obviously very self aware, and it may, I guess all like the travels and the and the the the, the inner thinking it, it's just more mirrors it's just more times that you've met yourself as well so i guess you as we get older we want to we want to make sure we like what we see so maybe you just yeah, figured that out at don't, don't get me wrong i'm still i'm still an idiot i still fuck up all the time i'm sure, so many man. mistakes no judge yeah i i i, I i'm see i I don't know you that well. I, I mean, you weren't flamethrowering people at 12, you know, no offense, Nate. You started at a little <laughs> bit higher than I did. <laughs> <laughs> we're, all, we're all at different spots. But, uh, but like I said, we're all human too. Like, I'm sure you uh, trip down the proverbial path. But, yeah, you but, know, and at the end of the day, not just for me, but you just, you have to do shit that makes you happy. And it's probably the most cliche thing to say, you know, do shit that makes you happy. But people don't do that. It's a shame that it is cliche because it's like, it's not common knowledge. Well, it is common knowledge, but it's not acted commonly. It's most people don't do what they love and like it's too simple. It's hard to grasp for some people who are in who are just mixed up in so much karma, if you will. Mm. But you know, people chase short term like short term dopamine rushes. Mm -hmm. Like whether it's the next paycheck or like having sex with the next girl at the club or whatever it is. But you they don't think long term. Like where do you see yourself in ten years? And I I don't have I'm not one of those guys who plan shit. Like I don't have a one-year plan, five-year plan. I just go with the flow. Mm. But I know, like at least for me, like experiencing colleges and countries, that's that's super high on my list of happiness. So that's like me supporting my lifestyle. That's my main goal and main motivation is just being able to have the freedom to do what I want when I want with whoever I want. Mm. Yeah, and I think a lot of people would agree with that. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. I I definitely resonate with it. We kind of talked about it the other day. Maybe not everybody feels like that. Well, you, you mentioned it earlier. Some people might just be happy with like a nine to five or something. And it's hard for me to imagine, to be honest. And I got to just figure out, I guess, that I'm that kind of person. And I need to get that my happiness doesn't lie there. I have to just kind of yeah. stop comparing and be in that zone. Well, but I don't know. That's right. me anyway. We, we spoke about it in the last episode is just that it comes down to two choices of how you live your life. Is it out of fear or, out, or is it out of love? And it's like... Your fear, if you made the choices out of fear, you would have left Thailand with your buddies and came back home because maybe you were afraid of that uncomfortable moment. Mm. And then you leaned into your fear and now look where you are today. It's just like that chunk of five years, how different it would have been had you came back to Montreal. And I'm not saying your life would be bad. I'm just saying it would be different and maybe not fulfilled because you had this drive to continue onwards. And if you ignored it, I wonder what that would have been like, you know? And I think that's where I a know. lot of people they have those moments and they choose the safety net. They choose the comfort. And then at like 40, you hear it all the time. They wake up and just start panicking. They have like a, at 3 a.m. They wake up and like, what have I been doing in my life? That's such a common story you hear. And then they, people, we have a label for it. It's like a midlife crisis. Like you'll see like a guy in his 50s just buy a Ferrari or something. And they're like, oh, he wants to just like, what's going on there kind of thing, you know? Compensation. Yeah. It's funny. Yeah, I mean, I think the coolest thing, one of the coolest things would be if you had the power to go back to like key decisions in your life just and just see what the outcome would be. Yeah. Like have a flash, a flash forward of everything that would happen. Oh, what was that movie? Uh, Is it Butterfly Effect? Butterfly Effect. Oh, that too, actually, with the uh, with uh, Kutcher Ash there, Ashton Kutcher. With Ashton the, Kutcher, yeah. This was older. It's called Sliding Doors, I think, or Revolving Doors, something like that, with uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, I think. And it's like okay, the, the movie yeah. is literally two storylines, and it's her. It's two different lives happening at the same time, like like parallel universes. A really cool concept for like a I don't know like an '80s or '90s movie. Also, uh, Mr. Nobody is kind of like that, but that's a trippy movie. That's like a uh, who's that guy from Thirty Seconds to Mars? Like one of the Jokers. There, he did he did the new Joker. He was in Gladiator. Jared Leto. Hmm. There we go. Took me a second. Yeah, I haven't I haven't seen any of those. Mr. Nobody was cool, but it's trippy. Uh, but but sliding doors, yeah, it's it's an interesting concept. It's uh, I think a lot of people have a kind of anxiety, but but the 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 right path might be that fear love thing, you know. Like I I've noticed in my life, and maybe these like forty fifty year old people waking up with anxiety, I'm sure they notice it as well. You keep talking about something. There's things where I'll say, oh, I wish I could travel more. I wish I could go to school and take this class, this program, this subject. There's things that are pulling me. And if I just go fuck it and I try it out, even though I have no real plan, like you said, like you're just like, I know what, what I want to do now. And the, the future is very ambiguous. Maybe it's a sign of intelligence. Maybe it's a sign of intelligence to say the future is ambiguous. Why would I bother trying to plan? But I know what I want to do. I know where I want to be. 
and just kind of let that magnet play out, like that mag that magnetism play out. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with you. And it, I mean, I think just surrounding yourself with good people and being in a good place mentally and yeah. physically, like geographically in a, in a place that you think makes you happy. Stuff, shit, just, like shit just happens. I love that. Yeah, shit just happens. It really does. <laughs> it does, though. It's just like... <laughs> For good or bad. Like, I, I, I'm sure you have like thousands of accounts, where not thousands, but a shit ton of accounts where things were probably a little bit chaotic or just uncertain and then it just all made sense from like some type of small little thing that just changed and then it's like ah it worked out in the end and things always end up working out it's just like our panic and our reactions are really are what's creating the effect you know but it's not chaotic it's just it's just happening and we just got to flow with it i know i just hope things work out for that flamethrower kid dude we're gonna find him we're gonna get him on here i'm gonna give him the biggest <laughs> hug possible <laughs> I, josh i think we'll we'll cut it at this part um Look, bro, I'm so happy to catch up with you in this kind of context. It's so cool. Likewise, man. It's been too long, and this is fun. You guys have a, a dope setup over there. You like it? Maybe we'll get you in here I one do. day if you, if you come down to Montreal. The couch is new, actually. That's, yeah, yeah that's and I'm not just saying shit. You guys have an open invite to Ecuador. I, look, I'm going to see because I have to get I a new passport because uh, my passport is all damaged. And then I really want to get out of this city and just start doing things and living a normal life for whatever long period of time it is. So I would actually take you up on that idea. It sounds phenomenal. I'm down and that would be, would, be, would be a pleasure. It's a, it's a big ask, you know, so we, we appreciate it. Drink time. some ayahuasca it's in Ecuador. Cool. We'll, yeah, we'll do man. a little video together, whatever. <laughs> I know like three <laughs> words. <laughs> Let me just give one more quick shout out, if you don't mind, to Absolutely. the charity that sponsored my last video. Absolutely. So it's, it's called A Ripple, supporting the Venezuelan people. And we're actually selling this, they call it dignity kits. So it's, it costs $11 American and it has like hygiene stuff for your body. Cause one of the, the main problems with people on the street is they get sick and their kids get sick cause they don't have proper hygiene. Like they have no soap, no toothbrush, uh, no toothpaste, none of that stuff. Okay, yeah. So for $11, you're sponsoring a family to get a bunch of, of shit. Like, um, the video is going to come out next week explaining more about it, okay. but shampoo, soap, nail clippers, all stuff for your body. So our goal is to raise $2,200, which is 200 kits. Wow. So that's yeah, so potentially helping 200 kits, families. $11 each. That's the goal. So that could help 200 families. 200 families, yeah. Okay. That's incredible, man. And we're going to – I'll make this into a clip and put this on Facebook and YouTube and help because I know we spoke about it briefly, but I know it's crazy what's happening in Venezuela. And this is a beautiful uh, help – that you guys are providing yeah thank you man and i'll yeah. send you the video will be out next week so i'll make sure to send it to you with all the links and whatnot that's incredible man and josh thank you for what you're doing and bro you're living it up and i see your demeanor has changed you're just more you're just you're always awesome but i just feel like a different energy coming from you a very more a more fulfilled energy and i'm just happy to see you're doing what you love bro thank you man i appreciate that thank you sammy Oh, it's a pleasure, man. Dude, thanks for coming on. Honestly, yeah. we can't wait to have you on again. I, I, I'm I, going to take you up on that offer as well. Uh, we're going to come down, and it's going to be a fun Oh, bro, time. please please do, man. Please <laughs> do. That'd be so much fun. All right, my brother. All right, brothers. Thank you. Yeah. Peace. Peace. Bye-bye. Peace. Peace within.